This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. What if extreme climate tipping points can be tripped far sooner than models predict? Expect the unexpected, says Johannes Lohmann, a postdoc researcher at Denmark's famous Niels Bohr Institute. His five papers as a young scientist hunt for abrupt climate events during the last glacial period. Now he has news about grave risks in the future. Johannes Lohmann, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks a lot for having me. Your paper, it's absolutely shocking, and it's not easy to shock me these days. You know, but let's get there step by step. You intensively studied something called the Danskart Oshkarg events. What are they? Has a rapid warming like that happened in, say, the last thousand years? Um, these Danskart Oshkarg events are abrupt climate changes in the last glacial period. And the last glacial period spanned from about 120,000 years ago to uh, 12,000 years ago when the Holocene began. And these events are basically the, the, the best evidence we have that abrupt climate change can happen even on a large scale. And during these events, uh, which are best recorded in Greenland ice cores, temperature over Greenland rose by up to 15 degrees Celsius in a matter of a couple of decades. And this had repercussions around the globe. So these were events where the pace of climate change was even faster than what we're experiencing now. And um, unfortunately, the cause of these events is not really, well, it's still debated. It, uh, there's a lot of progress being made in, in recent times, but there's still no consensus of what the mechanism behind these is. And so, of course, if we want to predict climate change in the future, we have to try to build models that can also explain climate change in the past. I want to go back to what you just said a minute ago. We don't know why these events happened. Earth seems to coast along in one climate for thousands or even millions of years, and then it shifts. Are these shifts always towards a warmer world, or can they also be toward cooling? Yes. So, so these Tensko Oshka events, they have been happening um, within the last 100,000 years. So they stopped about uh, 20,000 years ago, even though the last deglaciation, so the period where we transitioned from the last glacial period into the current uh, warm period, was also very abrupt. Well, let's say the ice cores show that Greenland ice has increased by around 8 degrees C over 40 years at some point, within a single human lifetime. Does that prove that the whole world warmed that far, that fast? So these shifts, uh, they, they, they come in cycles. So they actually comprise both a warming and a cooling, even though the warming is a little bit more abrupt. And um, in terms of the cause of these, so we don't know of any um, external forcing that can explain why these climate changes have been happening with the periodicity that they have been happening and also with the abruptness. So they are in some way an, in, an internal mechanism in the climate system. And, and in, even though we know quite a bit about what parts of the climate system played a role in these changes, we don't really know the, the precise trigger of these events. When we're talking about these things, Johannes, do you prefer the term critical threshold or tipping point? Good question. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm fine with both. I mean, critical threshold would uh, sort of assume that there is such a thing as a critical threshold in the system that needs to be crossed in order for this to happen. A tipping point would be maybe a, a slightly more general term that describes this phenomenon. And we're not really sure which of these apply, actually. So, so um, both uh, terms are good from my side. Was it your previous research or something else that brought you to ask this key question? Is Earth's climate basically unstable? Certainly. So, so my um, well, I entered this this field from from the complex system science, and there you hear a lot about nonlinear dynamics and abrupt shifts that can suddenly happen with only a very slight uh, or very slow and 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 slight triggers. And then when I started to study uh, paleoclimate and, and, and seeing all of these abrupt changes happening in the past and seeing that a current generation of climate models has a really hard time in, in reproducing these changes, it, it uh, seems very urgent to, uh, to, try to, see, okay, uh, to try to see whether we can capture any of these processes uh, happening in the future. Your new paper is published in the top journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The title is Risk of Tipping the Overturning Circulation Due to Increasing Rates of Ice Melt. Let's unpack that a little bit. Is ice melt increasing at both poles? It is certainly increasing in Greenland. Um, in Antarctica, it depends a little bit on, on which part of the ice sheet you're looking at, but for the overturning circulation, 
What is important is the Greenland melt, and there's uh, strong evidence that this has been increasing from satellite data, so basically direct evidence of this happening. Please describe for the non-scientist what you mean by the overturning circulation. So the overturning circulation, here I'm, uh, in this paper I'm talking specifically about the Atlantic overturning circulation, and that is a system of currents which is part of a, uh, a global ocean circulation that transports heat and water masses around the globe. And what happens in the Atlantic is that this is a flow is sort of like a loop where warm water is transported from the low latitudes to the high latitudes uh, northwards at the surface. And then this water, this uh, uh, fairly warm and salty water, is being cooled by the atmosphere, and in the high latitudes it starts to sink and then return back southwards, where it then upwells and, and closes this loop. So you have um, a circulation that basically distributes heat from south to north, and by doing so it really shapes the climate specifically of the northern hemisphere, but also of the southern hemisphere. Yes, it's pretty important for the UK and Europe, and probably for Denmark, I guess, that if you had the winters of the latitude where you are really located, you would be much colder, except for this warming current. That's precisely true. I mean, you can, you can for example, compare Canada, uh, where you're located, to, to, to Scandinavia, and you can see, if you look at equal latitudes, you can see quite big differences in temperature. That's true. Have scientists previously attempted to quantify when this Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, to use the formal term, when it could shift, even in what century we might expect that big change? Certainly. So there's, uh, our, our study is far from being the first of, of, of asking that question. This has been a concern for quite a long time, both in the context of, uh, of paleoclimate, but also in the future. Um, but it requires fairly long uh, simulations with, with climate models. So this, there has been a long quest for this happening. But so far, also the most realistic ensemble of climate models disagree quite a lot on, uh, on, on where actually this tipping point is sitting, and even if there is such a tipping point, so there's still no uh, consensus in between models. Well, suppose current climate models could assure us that ice melts slowly enough. The Atlantic current could not be diverted for at least the next few hundred years or more. Why are you warning we cannot rest safely on that kind of prediction? Well, there are two things. So first of all, what our study is showing is that rate also matters. So most uh, studies so far have been looking at a tipping point in a more classical sense, which means that there should be some kind of concrete value of, of, of a climate forcing, which in this case well, could either be the CO2 levels or more directly the melt coming off of Greenland. And if you slowly approach this tipping point, then you will tip at exactly that value. But what our study is, is showing that you could have this other effect, which is called rate-induced tipping, where a tipping can actually occur even before this threshold, given that you approach the threshold at a, at a faster rate. So this is something that could go on top of, of this uh, tipping point that, that, that has already been uh, discovered before, and this could mean that the, that the ocean circulation would tip earlier. But another aspect that we're also uh, seeing in our study is that if you, if you look at tipping points in fairly complex systems, which feature chaotic dynamics, it can happen that you're actually not really able to predict at what point the system is going to tip because there's a very sensitive dependence on the initial state of the ocean when you're starting to make this change to the climate system and also on the exact progression of this climate forcing, so the, so the exact um, value of the rate of change that you're using. And this could make it fundamentally impossible to actually predict where, where exactly this tipping point will lie. I'm trying to picture this, and I'm thinking in my mind perhaps an older man with a heart condition who's going to run for a mile. He can do it if he just takes it steady and runs that mile. But if he suddenly races up too quickly in the middle of the race, he might fall over because his heart has overreacted. Is that the kind of situation you're describing when you talk about the rate importance, the rate tipping point? Yeah, I think that's a very good analogy, actually. This is, this is precisely what, what, what we're looking at. Well, a few years ago, I interviewed a young Texas scientist who used abandoned coral reefs to show sea level rise, and they jumped up several feet suddenly, much too quickly for coral to adapt, and they drowned. It was not the steady ramp up we show in our charts. Do you think that we are being dangerously deceptive in our assumptions about gradualism? I think so. I mean, these, these, uh, these kind of effects where rate can matter also qualitatively, not only quantitatively, have not really been stressed enough. I mean, everybody is, of course, aware that the rate of change 
of, clim of climate change matters in terms of our ability to adapt toward the changing climate. But also here we saw that it can matter actually the, quali the qualitative outcome of this climate change experiment, if you want to call it like that, can matter, can depend on the rate of change that you're using to get there. So there should be more emphasis given on this. Johannes Lohmann, what sort of feedback about this paper are you getting from other scientists? I'm getting fairly positive feedback. Um, of course, it's, it's, it's worrying news, but at least in the, in the more mathematically inclined community, people have been waiting for this effect to be uncovered also in a climate model. So, so, so people are, are excited about it, even though it's, of course, uh, pretty bad news. As you state in the new paper, this insight into instability may or may not apply to super complex natural systems at the global level. Is there any way to take your research to the next step to find out? Certainly. Two avenues would be good. I mean, one is the obvious avenue is just to try to look at this phenomenon in, in even more complex models, so very coupled climate or Earth system models that, that incorporate more processes than we had. This, of course, um, just takes a lot of computational effort, but at some point that should definitely be done. Uh, and the other aspect would be to, to try to understand the physics of these tipping points better, to, uh, to understand what are actually the physics that determine whether such this rate-induced effect is present or not. And um, I think if these two lines are pursued in parallel, we might uh, know more about whether this effect will apply in, in the real climate system. Well, given what we know so far, Johannes, should we accept that civilization could be jeopardized by a rapid jump in temperatures, that it is possible? I certainly think so, unfortunately. Even though our study is, is not um, precise enough to give you the quantitative evidence for this, but just pointing out that this effect can exist given that you have a tipping point, I think would be enough to take this risk seriously. Well, in my view, your science is another reason to declare a global climate emergency, to apply every break we can on human greenhouse gas emissions as soon as we can. If we allow the possibility of multiple instabilities, we have to take it to government leaders and the people who are consuming fossil fuels and say, OK, we may have to change our urgency and our message. Do you feel that's the case with the science that you are bringing up? I think it is the case. Again, of course, it's difficult to convince people without any uh, strong quantitative evidence. But I think in, in, in if, if this research that we have been doing is being confirmed by other models, it might be a good idea to, to also bring this rate of change into play here, because currently, I mean, if you look, for example, at, at the Paris Agreement and so on, I mean, all of the climate targets have been targeting certain levels of climate change, either in terms of warming or, or total CO2 output into the atmosphere. But it might be um, at some point worthwhile to also include a cap on the rate of change as, as kind of another um, dimension of this, of this safe operating space that we're trying to stay in. Yet again, I'm trying to picture where we really are with what we know and what we don't know about climate change. I remember multiple news stories about tourists who visit the Grand Canyon. They want to get selfies uh, right near the edge, so they keep backing up to get a better shot, and then, sadly, uh, some of them fall in. I wonder if that isn't where we are right now with climate, that we're backing up rather blindly into the climate situation, that we are just discovering how it works. I think certainly that that's unfortunately the case. So um, even though, uh, if you take as an example this tipping point that we're looking at, which is the uh, overturning circulation, so far, luckily, the models say that we are still quite a far, uh, far way ahead of this tipping point in terms of the uh, amount of meltwater that you would need it to shut down the circulation. But on the other hand, these same models don't really agree well with observation. So you can, you can now, for I think 15 years now, you can actually observe the strength of this circulation and, and, and you could see a slight, or not even a slight, you can definitely see an, a decrease in the circulation, which is not really captured by the models. You can also see a much higher variability of the circulation that is not captured by models. So it might be that this tipping point is earlier than these models are telling us. So in, in a way, we are approaching um, this tipping point rather blindly. Are you and your colleagues at Niels Bohr Institute able to continue your science despite the pandemic? It depends a little bit on, on who you ask. Unfortunately, um, a large part of our group um, has been dealing with ice cores, and we've been very much impeded by the, by the pandemic. I'm, I'm luckily mostly working with theory, so running computer models and so on, and, 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 and this could be done uh, fine from home.
But all of the field work that is typically put into collecting ice cores in Greenland has been halted now already for the second year in a row. So unfortunately, it has been quite a big blow to the science in our group. Yes, I talked with an Antarctic specialist whose expedition was cancelled because of COVID. And in fact, he said it might even be delayed two years because they need an extra year to get all the supplies they need down there by ship. And that ship only goes once a year. So science is well on the edge with the pandemic, as is everything else. Yeah, that's unfortunately exactly what also happened to our group. So I was also supposed to go to Greenland both uh, this year and last year to help with drilling of the ice core, but both of these seasons had to be cancelled. But of course, nobody to blame uh, for that. I mean, these are pretty vulnerable parts in the earth, so, so they are really trying to um, um, keep the virus out as much as possible. I see a pattern and direction in your published papers so far. Where is it taking you, Johannes? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not really sure um, what I want to do next. I've been um, now also interested in, in um, extreme events in a more general um, perspective, which also had been fueled quite a bit by the pandemic that we're experiencing, because it's just, it's just another very, very large extreme event that nobody really saw coming. What I've been trying to work on in, in the past, also with this paper, is, is a little bit to think about what kind of extreme events can we predict, how can we predict them, and how can we implement these, these findings that, 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 we, that we see from, for example, idealized model studies? So I think this is kind of a direction in general where I want to be heading. We've been speaking with Dr. Johannes Lohmann from the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. Find links to his new paper and much more in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Johannes, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.